Welcome to the Stanford Medicine Diabetes Wellness Series, hosted in partnership with the Health Library. My name is Anna Simos. I manage the Stanford Diabetes Care and Prevention Program at Stanford Medicine. November is National Diabetes Month. And it's a time when, we, when the communities across the nation come together to raise awareness about diabetes and its impact on public health. We are happy to introduce the first presenter of this very important series. Dr. Mehdi Skiri will talk about how psyllium fiber and it has its positive impacts on health and associated, con associated conditions as well as metabolic syndrome. Mehdi was trained and worked as a physician in Paris. He came to the United States and did a research fellowship at UCSF in genetics and diabetes. Then he found his way to Stanford and completed two fellowships, uh, one in the heart transplant and then a second in the research in research in pulmonary hypertension. We are lucky to have Dr. Skiri as, as an internist in the Stanford primary care clinics at Stanford Healthcare, as he's a wonderful advocate for his patients and a wonderful educator to both patients and colleagues. Please. Um, so I would really appreciate, uh, but we appreciate Mehdi presenting and any questions we'd really appreciate if you would enter in the Q&A section and at the end of the presentation, we will make sure that uh, we get to them. Thank you so much. And with that, I will let Dr. Scary tonight kick off the series. Thanks, Mehdi. Thank you, Anna. Thank you everybody for coming tonight uh, after a day at work and uh, to listen to me. Uh, tonight it's the community lecture series of November 7th, 2024. And uh, we are going to talk about a very specific fiber in the context of uh, metabolic syndrome. So what is the issue? What brought this uh, uh, discussion for tonight? Using data from the USA, 60% of the calories consumed uh, every day comes from sugar-rich, nutrient-depleted food. That's for the USA. It's a bit lower in Europe. So let's take an example. What, what do I mean by nutrient-depleted food? So taking data from the US Department of Agriculture just before the pandemic, and just focusing on an uh, adult male from 19 to 50. Uh, I did the math myself. So the protein I taken in excess of 93%. Carbohydrate, and we see what we mean by that, I taken in excess of 183%. Vitamin B12 in excess of 195%. Not everybody, not everything's taken in excess. For example, vitamin C seems to be at goal. But when we look at dietary fibers, we are down minus 54%. And this is using the data from the USDA. Uh, different calculation shows even I could be at six, minus 61. So we take about a third of the, of the fibers we should be taking every day. So what are fibers? It's a very complex uh, topic. And I'll tell you why we're going to just to do psyllium tonight. But first, let me address the elephant in the room. And this elephant, it's an AI-generated uh, elephant that my daughter likes. So whatever my daughter says, I do. We're not going to talk about constipation today, or a little bit. So fibers doesn't equal constipation. So the complexity of fibers is shown here by the different categories. Um, there's about 30 categories in this graph. And I just picked only one psyllium here for its uh, unique properties. Uh, you see, we could write a full book on, on fibers. I'm just going to write one chapter tonight. So this is why today I call the, 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 this presentation to be psyllium or not to be a tale about the dietary fiber and the metabolic syndrome. One citation I like, and, uh, and you see it would be self-explanatory by the end of the presentation. We must cultivate our garden. That's an old citation from a, a, a French writer. 
Disclosures have no conflict of interest, no affiliation with the industry, and are practice evidence-based medicine. So the agenda for tonight, it's a bit dense. It's a bit dense, there's a lot of things to review. And uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to review the, uh, some basic concepts in, uh, in, uh, in uh, human physiology. Uh, so that will be part one with the objective, the methods, and the definitions. Then the second part will be reviewing the effect of psyllium condition by condition. And the third one is much more like a practical approach when we're going to review side effects. And I will share with you some practical considerations. So the objective for tonight, uh, I'm trying to propose a really down to earth approach to the use of psyllium, and not only for patients, but also for care providers. And this is based on the current vehicle science uh, as of today. The method I used, it's reviewing, it's a, it's a small review of literature, review of the current vehicle evidence on psyllium and metabolic parameters. I focus first on meta-analysis. So meta-analysis is a group of, uh, it, it's a study of different uh, uh, studies and it's supposed to be the strongest evidence in medicine. There's a pyramid of, uh, of the strength of different studies and this is at the top. Tonight, we're only focusing on uh, human adult subjects. The search term used was where psyllium and relevant condition in human adults. And once uh, my references were uh, established, I uh, validated them or completed them using AI. And for the practical approach, I used, of course, whatever was published, but also experts' opinions. So experts' opinion are the lowest uh, value in terms of medical evidence. So definitions. We're going to start today by uh, trying to uh, simplify what the gastrointestinal functional anatomy is. Um, it's a really complex organ and it is much more than just digestion. We review rapidly what microbiome is. We try to review what fibers are, what cilia is, and we try to find a, a definition of metabolic syndrome. So let's start. So that goes to intestinal anatomy. No, everybody knows where it starts from and where it ends. Oropharynx, like the back of the mouth, osophagus, stomach, then small intestine made of duodenum jejunum ileum, then the large intestine that usually people agree on cecum, colon, and rectum. The small intestine is about seven meters of length, so that's about 22 feet. And I think this is a cadaveric uh, uh, measurement, so it could be longer in real life. And the large intestine is about uh, 1.8 meters or five, six feet of length. And it doesn't get the name because of the length, but because of its diameter. So the small intestine is long and thin and the large is wide and, and short. So let's see what those uh, three stages do uh, for digestion. Really fast, food arrives in the stomach, has to be processed, uh, the stomach has two different uh, levels, one to accommodate the food, the other one, it's a churning, a, a churning area mixed with some enzymes and pretty acidic uh, environment, possibly to uh, protect us against bacteria. Then the food after 40 minutes or, or th 40 minutes to three hours, uh, slowly makes it to the small intestine through the pyloric sphincter. And here, this is the site when there's more movement, more mixing, and also from the, from uh, through the duodenum coming from, from the pancreas and from the gallbladder, we have uh, enzymes and bile that are here to help with the digestion of sugars, let's say sugars for now, carbohydrate, uh, lipids and uh, proteins. There's also, after, after the, the, the digestion of those enzymes, of the hydrolysis of those uh, molecules, they are absorbed by the small intestine along with micronutrients such as B12, iron, and other things like this. Following the small intestine, the chyme makes it to the, to the large intestine where it's going to stay for 10 to 59 hours. And this is an area where mainly there's some storage, 
absorption of water, fine absorption of water to, to finally form the feces. Oh. Also extraction of sodium. And this is also the house of uh, the microbiomes, um, all the microorganisms that live in the large intestine. And those will be using the fibers for fermentation. So we're slowly getting to the, to the core of the issue. So the microbiome, as I said, it comes with different terms. Gut microbiome should be said, actually. There's also a microbiome on the skin. Um, it comes with different terms. Uh, 25 years ago, we were saying gut flora. Now we say gut microbiota or microbiome. Uh, there's a gradient. Uh, there's a really low burden of, of, uh, uh, of germs or microorganisms. Uh, from the stomach, and the number increases greatly all the way down to the colon. The microbiome, as I just said, uh, ferments the fibers. And in exchange for that, they give us back some short-chain fatty acids and vitamins. Uh, those short-chain short fatty acids and vitamins are really important for the health of the colon, but even beyond that. And we see what it can do. So just a quick summary. I went through a lot uh, uh, pretty fast, but let's just keep this in mind. Small intestine, that's where the enzymes do the job, and it's here for digestion and absorption of nutrients. The large intestine that the house of the microorganisms, they ferment fibers for us, and that promotes colon health and much more uh, beyond the colon. So what are fibers? So as I said again, fibers are not here for um, only for fighting for constipation. It has been endorsed all over the world by many different uh, health bodies, uh, FAO, WHO, FDA in the USA, Indian Dietetic, Dietetic Association, or the French uh, Agency of Safety of uh, Food, Food Safety. So what are fibers? And more precisely, what are dietary fibers? In 2016, the FDA finally came up with a definition of what fibers were. Um, and I think it took them about 20 years to, to, to issue their recommendations. So for them, fibers are non-digestible. That means when they go through the small intestine, they're not digested by us. Non-digestible carbohydrate, at least three or more monomeric units. And the dietary part means they are beneficial to human health. So the definition has two parts. The first list was about seven uh, fibers, and you can see psyllium husk was one of them. Uh, this list was uh, augmented in 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021. So let's review a bit uh, what type of fibers we're dealing with. So saccharides are carbohydrates. So carbohydrates in the definition of the FDA, it's a chain, it's a chain, it's a carbon chain with a molecule of H2O. So for example, it's NNC and MH2O. The monomeric unit from the FDA definition is called a monosaccharide. Uh, the ones we all know, glucose, fructose, galactose. When those combine with each other, for example, they create sucrose, that's a glucose and a fructose. And sucrose, everybody knows it as the table sugar. Then we also have the lactose that makes some people intolerant. And then when we reach more than 10 mono, uh, mono, um, monomeric uh, units, we talk about polysaccharides. The polysaccharides can be extremely long in the southern. Uh, starch are part of uh, polysaccharides, glycogen too. Those are polysaccharides made of glucose. And psyllium is a polysaccharide. So trying to make things clear, not all carbohydrates are correct. For example, the polyol are not side, but they're also part of uh, uh, the carbohydrate family. And trying to, to explain when sometimes we hear sugar, uh, sugar have a different definition in science. Uh, we have uh, seven types of sugar right here, glucose, galactose, fructose, et cetera. And just to make things even worse, Polyols are sugar, are called sugar alcohol. So when we say carbs in general, I think we mean sugars, uh, one of the seven there. Uh, but for this talk, I stick to carbohydrates, it's the whole family. 
what is cilium uh, for fiber? So the, the way to look at fibers, beside the length, the length and how they're made, it's whether they're soluble or not. That means they dissolve in water, viscous or not. If they can form a gel depending on the different conditions um, and if they ferment or not. And fermentation, that's part of the colon. So by definition, nothing happens to them when they go through the small intestine and they get fermented or not in the large intestine. Cilium is made of two monosaccharides, uh, arabinose and xylose. Uh, in the table here, you see two examples of uh, fibers. Uh, cilium, we're going to talk about it tonight. And the other one is a guar gum. It's a partially hydrolyzed guar gum. Uh, I did this table so we understand that one fiber doesn't equal the other fiber. They're both uh, viscous, uh, viscous uh, fibers. Uh, one is fermentable, the other one is not fermentable. So what we can expect from cilium when it grows through the GI tract, we can expect it to be viscous in the stomach, viscous in the small intestine, and also viscous in the large intestine. But for the, the partially hydrolyzed guar gum, it would be between viscous and dissolved, completely dissolved, like not that viscous in the stomach, small intestine, but when it arrives to the large intestine, it would be used, it would be degraded by the, by the microorganisms or the microbiome. So just to illustrate uh, the differences between fibers. So cilium, cilium, the one we're talking about is the external layer of a seed, the seed of Plantago ovata. So with the name of uh, Ispagula, it's all, all names. One, it's related to the, the shape of the, of the leaves, leaves and the other one is related to the shape of uh, the flowers. Uh, one is like a, 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 the sole of a shoe, the other one is like a, a, the ear of a horse, I think. Uh, Plantago ovata has been used for 3,000 years in India and China for medicinal use. The main producer of uh, psyllium in the world is India with 80% of the production. The main market is the USA, second Europe, and it should be soon around $400 million a year. So what is the metabolic syndrome? So one definition of the metabolic syndrome, this is one definition from 2009 that the table on the right hand side, it's uh, someone to meet the criteria of metabolic syndrome has to meet uh, three criteria out of five. The five of them are having an elevated fasting glucose, elevated blood pressure, elevated triglyceride, reduced HDL cholesterol, or elevated uh, waist circumference. Some other guidelines introduce BMI uh, with a ethnicity uh, uh, twist to it. There's five, I think, five other definitions for the, the metabolic syndrome. I think the idea is just to raise the awareness that when someone meets those criteria, maybe something's wrong. Uh, I am not sure there's a, it's really useful in terms of, or, or really reflects the complexity of, uh, of, um, of, of uh, metabolic disorders. So let's take a big breath. We take a breath. And now we're going to see conditions by condition what psyllium can do. Uh, there's associated condition with metabolic syndrome, the obvious one diabetes, hypertension, obesity, dyslipidemia. And the other one that's potentially associated or most likely or very likely associated with metabolic syndrome will be what uh, people uh, casually call fatty liver, no, metabolic fatty liver in this, in this case, colon cancer, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, and gout. I could have added more. Uh, there's probably some link between Alzheimer and metabolic syndrome. Chronic kidney, chronic kidney disease and metabolic syndrome, but yeah, we have to, to we limit it by time. The first study we're going to look at is diabetes. So that's a meta-analysis. It was published in 2015 by Gibb. I checked on Gibb. He uh, at this time was working for Procter and Gamble, which is a company that uh, produces uh, some psyllium powder, orange. Uh, but the, the, the study the study is solid. He looked at uh, 35 uh, randomized controlled clinical studies. 
that were given giving a psyllium before meals for a duration of six to 12 weeks. So six weeks is a bit short period of time, but 12 weeks it's a, a bit better in order to see some results. And he looked at the results of his meta-analysis dividing two, into two groups, the cohorts, one with diabetes and the other one without diabetes. So no diabetes, pre-diabetic. In the cohort with diabetes, he showed that uh, those patients were decreasing after use of psyllium, decreasing the fasting blood glucose by 30 milligrams per deliter. They're having an A1C decrease by almost uh, 1%. So the A1C reflects uh, glucose in the sugar over three months. They also had a decreased postprandial glucose. That means after a meal, the sugar was not spiking as much as they were doing before. And uh, he couldn't uh, demonstrate any decrease in ceiling after a meal in this uh, cohort. And we come back uh, to this. In non-type 2 diabetes, he showed that not only the glucose after a meal was lower, but also the peak insulin. So the explanation is it's quite easy, I think, that he doesn't offer one, but the issue with diabetes, it's a mismatch between demand and 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 and, and uh, supply, supply being the insulin and demand being determined by glucose. And so what it shows here that simply the, the mismatch between insulin and glucose has not been corrected in type 2 diabetes with the use of psyllium. But he shows like a, also um, an effect, and that's the chart on the right-hand side. There's an effect depending on where we start from. Someone with no diabetes doesn't have a great response to psyllium, probably because he doesn't, they don't have to. But and then as the glucose metabolism gets more imbalanced, then that's where psyllium gets more efficient. And you see the, the, solid, the, the solid line, that's the level of sugar, fasting sugar uh, at baseline. And then the, the dot line is the one after treatment with psyllium. There's another meta-analysis from 2024 that showed that there were a threshold effect uh, they pick 10 grams, but what they mean that sometimes not when there's not an enough of a response with the uh, psyllium, it's probably because we're not taking enough. So how can psyllium help with the diabetes? So the main mechanism, and I think everybody agrees on that one, it's the viscosity of uh, psyllium fibers. This viscous, this viscous uh, 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 fiber, when they arrive in the GI tract, they increase satiety, and as a result, they decrease in ca caloric intake. But also, they interfere with the absorption of sugar by uh, two different uh, mechanisms. The first one, they interfere with, they interfere, uh, with the, the, the metabolism of sugar by the enzymes that are supposed to do it, amylase and glucosidase. And that's an effect that has been compared to the one of one of the medication we have, a carbose. But not only the big, the big carbohydrate cannot be uh, processed properly, but also they cannot be absorbed properly once they're processed by and the, the psyllium interfering, uh, being an interface between the absorption from the enterocytes and, and, uh, and the short carbohydrates. Also, there's another really interesting uh, mechanism that could account for the, the improvement of uh, glucose uh, control in diabetic patients. Cilium traps nutrients and brings them to the end of the small intestine, which is called the ileum. And when nutrients are detected that far down in the small intestine, they shouldn't be, there's a reaction with production of GLP-1 and other hormones like CKK and PYY. And I think everybody knows what GLP-1 is now. It's the, the hormone, the family uh, that people use to lose weight with, for example, a semaglutide. Also, another effect uh, uh, of, of the arrival of nutrients in the ileum, and that's called the ileal break, uh, it decreases secretion of gastric and bile acid in the, from the and the pancreatic enzymes. So there is less absorption because there is less enzymes to, to process the nutrients. GLP-1 as well, uh, 
decreases satiety, decreases the transit, gastric emptying, increases insulin secretion, decreasing glucagon effect, many effects. So after this positive uh, finding, let's move to hypertension. Another meta for 2020, I'm going to go really fast on this one. They did find a reduction, a, a positive reduction in systolic blood pressure uh, with 11 trials. The reduction was of two millimeters of mercury. Um, that's not enough. So it works, but it clinically has no application. Weight and overweight. Overweight and obesity, sorry. So here we have uh, two meta-analyses. Uh, one again from Gibb from uh, last year and one from Ofrad uh, from four years ago. I'm going to start with the one from Gibb. They don't show the same thing. So Gibb has used really strict uh, uh, criteria to include uh, uh, the six studies in his meta-analysis. He did exclude uh, studies that were too short in period of time. He excluded studies that were uh, studying the cholesterol effect of on cholesterol by psyllium, because in the studies they tend to ask people to maintain the same weight. So if there's any effect, it's not explained by the weight loss. And what uh, Gibb showed that, he showed that the body weight was decreased by 2.1 kilograms. So that's uh, five, five pounds, around five pounds. The BMI was in, decreased by almost one point. And, and that was achieved with the average dose of 10 grams over a duration of five months, 4.8 months. Now let's turn our attention to uh, the study from Mofrad. And actually the, the he showed that we're not, not a big difference, but Gibb addressed the issue from the Mofrad study. So Mofrad study, for example, had um, two or three studies that were really short in duration, like two to three weeks. He also had studies that were studying uh, cholesterol, the effect on cholesterol by psyllium. So it was specifically said that the patient was were maintained at the same weight. But nonetheless, the Morfat study was interesting because it showed that there's an effect uh, of psyllium that was better seen with a higher duration and with a dosage greater than 10 grams per day. So again, we see an effect around 10 grams. So how can someone lose weight uh, uh, with psyllium? It's really psyllium, it's only one molecule. So the same, the same effects, again, I've seen. It increases satiety by decreasing gastric emptying. That's one of the explanations. We saw that the ileal break too. It does reduce energy intake. It does reduce the absorption of the reduced energy uh, uh, nutrients. It also decreases uh, insulin levels and its effects on, ins on tissues. And because it's not fermented, you remember when it reaches the, 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 the colon, it stays as a viscous molecule. It doesn't participate to the uh, uh, energy balance of the human body. Fermentation of uh, fibers account for 10%, almost 10% in human beings of the total uh, energy we need per day. So th those are the main explanations of why some people can uh, um, lose weight on psyllium. So this Dyslipidemia, dyslipidemia that uh, high cholesterol or abnormal cholesterol, um, you name it. Study from uh, Jovanovsky, 2018, a Canadian study. She looked at uh, 28 random mass control studies with almost 2,000 patients. Median dose again was around 10 grams and for duration at least of three weeks. And she showed some significant results, uh, LDL cholesterol, decreased by 0 0.33 millimol per liter. Um, that's 12.8 milligrams per deciliters. deciliters. A, a better marker of uh, dyslipidemia is the non-HGL cholesterol, slightly decreased as well. And a more modern one is apolipoprotein B, that also decreased, but a really small amount. She noted that in her study, the heterogeneity was high. She didn't find any publication bias. And she said that the, the strongest quality uh, was for APOB. 
So I'm really happy it works for APOB. And I think that the future of uh, uh, cholesterol testing, uh, along with other markers, when ideal, it's um, it's a grandpa program. But uh, if, if it's positive, really, it's not that impressive either, but it's, it happens. So how that happens, it's a very interesting way. Uh, that's something I haven't talked about before. And again, it's the viscosity of uh, of uh, cilium that uh, seems to be the main uh, reason. So cilium not only traps uh, nutrients and interfere with enzymes, it also traps bile. And it's really important to know what happens to bile and where it comes from. Bile comes from the liver. It's synthesized in the liver from cholesterol. It is stored in the gallbladder. And with the food coming to the GI tract, it's released in the duodenum. Along the small intestine, it's going to help with the absorption of uh, lipids. Um, it's going to emulsify the lipids and allow the enzymes uh, to act on them and then to be absorbed. At the end of the small intestine, uh, the majority of the bile is reabsorbed and sent back to the liver. So what happens uh, with the cilium on board, cilium trapping bile, bile cannot be reabsorbed. So as a result, the liver finds itself deficient in cholesterol to make more bile. And where is going to find it? In the blood. So it's a way, it's an indirect way of getting rid of cholesterol. As I explained again, already, it decreased the absorption of cholesterol by interfering uh, by interfering with bile, it also decreases the lipase activity, and potentially, it's a better effect than another medication we use that does that or listat, and that was an animal model. It's also so we saw what it does to sugar, to glucose. It slows the glucose absorption, lower energy intake, and, and may and may induce weight loss. And all of those may be part of the equation. So metabolic dysfunction associated steatitic liver disease. I am sorry, but I didn't find any uh, good uh, data for today. I found three studies. One was not in English or not in a language I speak, and two were with the uh, design weaknesses. Uh, one, the inclusion criteria were not uh, strong enough. And the second one was more a study about weight loss than uh, a fatty liver. But nonetheless, different studies have shown a negative association between MSALD and fiber intake. That means the more fiber the population takes, the less MSALD we find. So it is a lot. Huh? I'm going to try to go slowly. <laughs> Colorectal cancer. So this is really important. Um, there is a direct link between colon cancer and uh, metabolic syndrome. And it's easy to understand metabolic syndrome is linked to food and food goes through the colon. I'm going to mention first uh, a link between metabolic syndrome and colorectal cancer. Two studies for major, one from Korea that showed that uh, metabolic syndrome increased the risk of colon cancer by almost by 26%. And that's mainly seen before the age of 50. Uh, because after the age of 50, the normal risk are here anyway. And the main predictor of risk of current cancer were the BMI, the body max index, and the waist circumference. A similar study in Taiwan showed also that metabolic syndrome increases the risk at an early age. And actually, we do see that. So we see colon cancer happening at an early age, early age. The Taiwanese uh, study also showed that uh, the more metabolic syndrome uh, 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 items we have, the higher the risk is. So those are for the new the the, the new uh, the new trends in colon cancer um, that have changed a lot over the past 20 or 30 but 20 years. But back in 1971, so that's 54 years ago, Berkey, a, a famous physician that. Uh, that many uh, care providers know about or should know about it. The, he gave his name to a specific lymphoma. Back in 71, 
he was living in Uganda, East, uh, East Africa, uh, that he had moved there uh, just after World War II because he thought he would be more helpful there than, than in the UK. And just by simple observation, with really nothing really uh, too sophisticated, he realized that the rate of colon cancer was really low in Uganda compared to Connecticut. And he linked that to the fiber intake at that time, which was eight times higher in Uganda than in Connecticut. And uh, I encourage all of you to read his paper from 1971. It, it's a really interesting way to see how papers were written uh, 54 years ago. And, and he got everything right 54 years ago, uh, just on his own. There are no other author in the paper. What do you know about uh, colorectal cancer and celiac? The most uh, convincing, convincing uh, study I found was from Spain. It's an epidemiological study. When they look at the whole country between 1995 and 2000, and they found a correlation between the consumption of celiac husk and the decreased risk of uh, colorectal cancer. So that's for the most convincing part of, uh, of those data. It's not, it's not always the last answer, you know, epidemiologic studies, um, they are good, but there's always some biases in the report of from a celium or which celium is taken, et cetera. There is no specific uh, randomized control studies on, um, on, uh, on celium and colorectal cancer. There's a big study on fibers and colorectal cancer from Central Berg. She's from, she was from Seattle. They looked at 75,000 people over eight years. And uh, it was not specifically about uh, uh, fiber. And uh, they, they showed something really interesting. They looked at soluble fibers like psyllium and insoluble fibers. And they showed that actually people taking, uh, uh, no, not sorry, sorry, not soluble and soluble, uh, um, fiber laxative and non fiber laxative. And they showed that people that take more than five times a year non fiber laxative have a higher risk of colorectal cancer but no data on psyllium. There's another big study the, from the Women Health Initiative with 167 uh, patients. They didn't show an effect of cerebral fibers on colorectal cancer. I don't want anybody to leave this talk with the, the, the impression that fibers don't help with colorectal cancer, preventing colorectal cancer. And so this is not about psyllium anymore. This is just to show you that really fibers seems to help and, and we have an idea how. Um, I'm not going to go through the, the right-hand side, but just to talk quickly about BTRA, to remember when fibers ferment, they release uh, the, the byproducts uh, are short fatty acids, short chain fatty acids. And one of them is BTRA, you have acetyl propanate, but BTRA is one of them. And it has been seen to increase with, uh, with taking psyllium. It's probably not because from fermentation, it's probably because psyllium improves colonic health but by increasing the amount of water and lowering the transit. And that has been sh 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 uh, shown in, in humans. And bitrate, it's a really magical uh, uh, short chain fatty acid, which has anti-carcinogenic uh, uh, properties and uh, apoptotic properties. So really properties against cancer. And that would be a whole different topic to talk about bitrate and its potential effect on colorectal cancer. So the, the message of this, uh, this uh, uh, slide is fibers do help. Okay. Irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, for those that don't know about this one, it's mainly abdominal pain, cramping, bloating, um, usually released by, uh, uh, by a bowel movement, come with depression, anxiety, uh, and really interfere with someone's life. It, it can come with constipation, diarrhea, or a mix of both. The association between metabolic syndrome and IBS um, has been clearly shown with a big study um, from Europe, 100,000 100, uh, subjects, that showed the genetic correlation between IBS, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and angina pectoris. IBS and psyllium, it has been recommended by all the 
or the Association of Gastroenterology, American, Canadian, British, Japanese. So I'm not going to review. Uh, just to say one thing about the American, it's really the, the main one they recommend and they recommend against uh, uh, many other ones. So Cilium is really the, the one for IBS. So how did IBS can help with, how does Cilium, can, how can Cilium help with IBS? So two mechanisms this time, it's not only viscosity, it's a lack of fermentation uh, that helps. So of course it decreases gastric emptying and small boil transit with, via the uh, ideal feedback loop. That's uh, the, the ideal break we, we, we reviewed earlier. But also it doesn't ferment in the colon. And something really well known is when a fiber ferments, it's really well tolerated in IBS. It, it creates a lot of cramps and gas. And one of the treatment for IBS is to remove a, a, a fibers that ferment. It also has a magical double effect, that's the way I called it. It forms the loose and loosens up the hard. So it seems counterintuitive that can do both at the same time, but let's see how that works. So cilium, because it's a gel, it has some bulk effect, but also it's not completely uh, soluble. It, about 20% of it is insoluble. And this bulk effect, uh, mechanically induces the secretion of mucus and water in the colon and improve the, the, the transit by uh, peristaltic uh, contraction. But also by itself, uh, psyllium increases the water content of the stools. You know, it's like a sponge uh, taking water. So it's making that loosening, loosening up the heart. In diarrhea, it's the same idea. The water holding capacity uh, uh, improves the loose stools transit and slows transit time. Also, in case of uh, better bitrate production in the colon, and we saw that happens in human beings with taking psyllium, bitrate promotes the reabsorption of water, and it's a potential explanation of why it can help with the uh, diarrhea. So what they have in common, those two, it's simply a, a, a question of viscosity. We can see the hard stool uh, being very viscous, and they are being, uh, having a very low viscosity, almost water. And so it, it balances up both. You know, it makes the hard stool uh, more viscous and uh, the loose tools uh, uh, more viscous. So inflammatory boil disease, this is a completely different uh, condition. It's an autoimmune condition. It comes with bloody diarrhea, chronic diarrhea, failure to thrive in, in kids. And uh, it, it can be complicated with structure, fistula, and cancer. It has been, uh, it has been linked to a, a Western diet. And possibly one of the mechanism would be disruption of the gut flora or the microbiome. The American College of Cardiology, as well as the European Society of Cardiology, uh, clearly state that it's a risk and answer in terms of cardiovascular risk. What do we know uh, between psyllium and IBD? It's mainly with ulcerative colitis. So IBD has two forms, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. In ulcerative colitis, there's two nice studies. One was done, it was psyllium versus placebo in patient in remission. And, uh, and, the effect, and the effect of psyllium was superior to placebo. Then the second study compared uh, a psyllium with mesalamine, again in patient remission, and it was similar. So mesalamine is one of the medications uh, we use for IBD. I did not find any, uh, any data on Crohn's disease to be reported. Um, again, suggested mechanisms, improving bowel transits. Possibly an anti-inflammatory effect that has been seen in a really nice uh, uh, colitis model in mice. Uh, the interesting part, uh, they were priming the the mice, and they were inducing colitis with fructose. Fructose was was inducing a colitis, either chronic or or, or, or acute, in mice, and that they could uh, reverse the effect of this trigger by fructose by giving psyllium in mice. And also in this uh, uh, mice model, they noticed that the gut microbiota or microbiome was modified with psyllium use. 
Just one stop, like I'm going a bit before the end of the talk. It's about IBD and um, NCM, the same way about cancer. I don't want uh, to convey the wrong message. Uh, I do not recommend anybody with IBD to start CM without uh, uh, running um, running it by his uh, GI doctor. And, and we'll see why. Gout, got interesting condition. Uh, King's disease. It's a, it's an inflammation of one joint. It's acute. It's due to the inflammation from the deposition of uric acid in the joint. It's a, it's a much more complex uh, uh, condition that we thought before. It's multifactorial for sure. Genetic factors, obesity, rich diet, consumption of fructose of ethanol, alcohol, like drinkable alcohol, and also time of the year. It's more frequent during the spring. Gout is also a, a cardiovascular risk and answer. Uh, 80, it increases the risk, cardiovascular risk for women by 88% and 49% in May before the age of 45. Uh, it, there's an association between gout and heart failure, ischemic heart disease, arrhythmia, heart disease, ven venous thromboembolism. The list is a bit longer. I invite you to look at the, uh, at the, the reference 34. What do you know about gout and, gout and psyllium? In animal model, uh, dietary fibers uh, uh, decrease uric acid level. I found only one case report uh, in the literature that showed a decrease. So I, I don't know if psyllium works in, in, with gout. Uh, it could work, but we need more data. We don't have enough. On the right hand side, you you have uh, someone called uh, William Pitt, the elder. Uh, he's an unknown founding father uh, for the USA. He was against tariffs uh, in the 18th century. And uh, because of uh, frequent gout access, he couldn't oppose a new tariff flow in, the, in, in, in Great Britain passed in 17, 1773. And 1773, it's uh, the, year, the year of the Boston Tea Party. So it was tariff on tea. And it was passed because you could not oppose it because of gout access. All right, let's go back to medicine. So psyllium and metabolic syndrome, uh, by order of what I think it's, uh, we have the strongest evidence. First one is diabetes type two. Then it's uh, irritable bowel syndrome overweight situations, dyslipidemia. There is not enough evidence to support its use for other conditions as of now. So risk of psyllium. A friend of mine, another physician said, uh, if a medication has no side effect, it's not a medication. So psyllium does have side effects. Uh, when taken, it can uh, make abdominal symptoms worse, like abdominal cramps or other GI symptoms. There is a risk of allergies, like everything else. And the, 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 some cases have been reported back in 1992 uh, of some severe cases uh, of uh, allergies. And there was an idea that where probably, probably there's a pre-sensitization to psyllium through inhaling the powder. And that was in people working in manufacturing uh, uh, grinding uh, psyllium. Some formulations uh, that can be bought don't come just with psyllium. They come with glucose, aspartame. And uh, one has to be uh, cautious with aspartame, especially in phenylketonuric patients. And uh, aspartame, there's an ongoing debate about risk of cancer or seizure. Some formulations also contain chemicals for coloring, taste, or just pesticide herbicides. Uh, lead in psyllium, uh, there is a, a, customer, a customer review that showed, um, that found some uh, uh, elevated psyllium level in, um, in uh, psyllium sold in the USA. It seemed that capsules have a higher psyllium uh, uh, lead level than some psyllium husk and powder. You can find the consumer report uh, online. 
So we not give the 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 brand that don't have a don't have a high level of lead. But usually capsules have a high level of lead based on on the one they've tested. To mitigate this message in animal model, um, psyllium actually increase the fecal expression of lead and decrease its absorption. So we don't know in human what it does, uh, but when one has a choice between a potentially high lead level in psyllium or not, I would go with the one with low lead level. It's not uh, specific to psyllium. Uh, we, we have uh, lead everywhere from human activities, same way we have arsenic, same way we can have a rice contaminated. At the risk of psyllium, it's called phytobezoa. Phyto means plant. Bezoa, it's a solid matter found in the stomach and intestine of remnants. Uh, basically, it's a big, big mass uh, of vegetables. It was first coined in the 12th century by the Tunisian writer Ahmed El Tifashi. The phytobezoa can occur at any level in the GI tract. Osophagus, small intestine, large intestine. It has been reported, uh, it has appeared to be very difficult to remove for the GI uh, 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 physicians, and some patients had to put under general anesthesia. So, this is why uh, I, I recommend special caution with patients with IBD, patients with a known, known structure, people with a history of. Uh, uh, gastric occlusion, risk of intestinal obstruction, or simply with difficulty swallowing. Another risk from psyllium, it's in the interaction between uh, uh, the medications we can take. The same way it can trap, it can trap bile, it can trap medications. I just gave a few examples of uh, medication that have been shown to be uh, decreased uh, when taken with psyllium. Levothyroxine, a medication for um, the thyroid. Olanzapatine, uh, a medication for schizophrenia. Carbamazapine for epilepsy. Lithium for bipolar disorders. Metformin for diabetes. Another, another uh, thing to consider when taking psyllium is when one takes medication for diabetes that can lower uh, be uh, lower the glucose to a level that would be symptomatic. So basically someone taking, for example, a, a insulin injection, baseline insulin injection, because the sugar may be, the average sugar may be lower, that put them at risk of having very low level of sugar. I didn't find any case that uh, uh, shows it, but psyllium has been shown with other uh, viscous uh, fibers. We just saw the risk of absorption of medication. There's a risk of uh, a potential risk of uh, decreased absorption of nutrients. In the rat model, it was shown that magnesium, calcium, zinc absorption were decreased with a pretty healthy dose of 50 grams of sodium per kilogram of food ingested by the rat. Uh, however, when it comes about human beings, uh, that has not been demonstrated, and we have at least two clinical studies that show there is no nutrients deficiencies for people taking psyllium. So you're going to ask me, I say I would be very practical, which form of psyllium to, uh, to use. So capsule, if someone wants to go with capsule, that's, that's an option. You remember what I said about lead. A capsule in the USA are uh, under dosage. They have a low dosage of 300 to 400 megas of psyllium. So if someone wants to achieve 10 grams a day, they would have to carry with them about 20 to 30 capsules a day. It's practical to carry around, but it has to be taken with enough water. The other form of psyllium comes at a whole psyllium husk or powder. And those are the ones with less, uh, less lead. If someone decides to go with a powder, one teaspoon of powder is five grams of psyllium. And one tablespoon of whole husk is about five grams. So how to take it? Uh, there's a rule of thumb. One gram of psyllium should be taken with at least 15, 50 milliliters or 100, 50 to 100 milliliters. Uh, the way to look at it, like psyllium can absorb um, 70 to 80 times its volume of water. So let's say if someone wants to take five grams of psyllium, it would be half a liter of water to go with it, or 16 ounces. For safety, some studies do that. 
uh, they add another glass of water after the ingestion of uh, psyllium. There's two brands. I looked at the labels of two brands. One recommends, uh, yeah, recommends 50 to 100 ml per grams, when uh, org recommends 60 to 140 ml. I'm not saying the whole uh, the whole name of the of commercial names. There's two different ways of taking it. Many studies recommend to, oh, in their protocol, they drink right away. They mix and drink. Uh, that's fine if it's taken with enough water. Uh, but some studies said to just mix it and wait. And I, I think I prefer this, the, 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 this way. Because by mixing and waiting 10 to 15 minutes, one can tell whether there's enough water or not. If it's too thick, just have to add more water. Uh, mixing with water doesn't help with the taste. The taste is like dirty. It's like a dirt, sorry, dirt taste. Uh, I would mix with uh, kombucha, for example. So how to take it? Everybody says to start taking once a day only, a low dose, two, three, four grams, and slowly increase as tolerated. So once a day for a week, twice a day for a week, three times a day for after that the goal as we saw and there is a, a a goal around 10 grams fda i think recommend seven grams so anything between seven and ten grams a day should achieve the goal uh, uh, desired in order to avoid the complication with the medication always start two hours to take the the psyllium take it two hours before any medication or two hours after any medication how to take it for weight crystal society and diabetes before a meal, and we saw why. For IBS, anytime should work. For constipation, it seems reasonable to wait to have a first bowel movement before taking it. And I'm not going to explain why, because we're running out of time. How to reduce the risk of lead contamination by renal brands, organic, whole husk, and avoid sugar, aspartame, and other chemicals. What to look for, bloating, abdominal discomfort or improvement. The patient I started on the psyllium, all of them told me the bloating was gone. That's the first thing they noticed. Look for constipation diarrhea, especially if the constipation comes without passing gas. That could be a sign of an obstruction. So now I think you understand what I meant by uh, we must cultivate our garden. On the left-hand side, there would be a colon without fibers. And the right-hand side, a colon with a, a happy microbiome. My references are here. I saw them online, but we'll post them online too. And thank you. I'm ready to take your questions. We have one participant who said, is taking Exetia the same as psyllium? Exetia, is it MI? Yeah, no, that's a, a it's a, a, oh God, I forgot the name of the other thing. Uh, it's a Nimine, uh, Nimine Peak, uh, C1L1 uh, inhibitor, no, it's different. It's different. Um, uh, Zetia inhibits the absorption of uh, of uh, of uh, cholesterol uh, uh, by, inhibi uh, by inhibiting the, the, the transporter. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Another participant asked, is it better to take psyllium or get fiber from um, the DASH diet? It's always good to take uh, the, the fibers from food. Yeah. Uh, uh, if someone is on DASH diet, I'm really happy with that. Uh, I think uh, psyllium is unique because it can be almost treated as a medication. Yeah. Uh, I, I found great effect. I'll give you an example on, on diabetes. I had a patient who was struggling to get her A1C uh, uh, below 10. Um, they were like close to 11. And after she started up psyllium, bloating was gone and uh, A1C was uh, decreased by 2%. So there's there's a difference. Yeah, psyllium, I would have psyllium more like a medication, but uh, fibers from, from, uh, from food, that's always the way to go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, here's another one. Um, hi, Dr. Skiri. It seems like um, the main benefit of psyllium is its viscous effects. Since soluble and insoluble fibers go hand in hand, do you have any recommendation, recommended intake ratios for soluble fibers and insoluble fibers? 
Uh, no, no, I don't have a recommendation. In cerebral fibers, you know, they're more used for for uh, uh, colon transit. You know, all the all the benefits we've seen from cerium are not there. Uh, and plus, you know, the cerebral fibers, um, some of them are fermentable, so they they promote a good colon health. So they, there's no really a ratio. Okay, thank you. And then there's another question from the same participant: um, yeah. Is it safe to take psyllium long term? What about the possibility of thinning the colonic, uh, the colonic wall? Should we take a break at one point? Yeah, so so CM doesn't have to be taken uh, long term. Yeah, uh, every day can be taken on the as needed uh, uh, way. Uh, there is no study long term I found on psyllium. That's why, for example, I haven't talked about uh, coronary artery disease. This is a long term condition. Uh, when it comes about the 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 mucin layer of, of the colon, I think that's what the question was referring to, or, or just the health of the colon. As we, we saw, um, the administration of psyllium increases the secretion of bitrate in the stool. That means there's more bitrate in the colon, and bitrate has been shown to be very uh, important to uh, the barrier of the colon, uh, tight joints, and and and. And so I, I, I don't have any specific data on, on colonic uh, uh, biopsies after psyllium use, uh, but I would say it's most likely beneficial than anything else. Thanks. And mm. and then there's, um, when is the best time to take psyllium to reduce the risk of diabetes? So it's before meals. As we said, you know, it's uh, 10, 20 minutes before meals. <clears throat> because it has to be there to interfere with the absorption, um, the metabolism and the absorption of sugar, and also to kick the uh, to kick the uh, the ileal break. Uh, the ileal break it's a bit more complicated than that because if you remember, it, 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 it takes like six hours in the small intestine, but ileal break happens before it reaches the uh, the the ileum. So there's something more to the ileal break, but it's before the food because you you want cilium to be there in the small intestine to interfere with the absorption. Yeah. Thank you. And then another question, does psyllium help for microscopic colitis? Uh, microscopic colitis psyllium, uh, I don't have any data on that. Um, uh, we have the I I IBD, IBD and ulcerative colitis, they were in remission. Um, uh, and on Crohn, I didn't find any data. So um, I don't have an answer to this question. And then there's another one. Is it wise to take medications separately from taking psyllium? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, we reviewed like the, the risk of malabsorption with levothyroxine, for example, even metformin, some really, uh, uh, really uh, common medications. Um, always two hours apart. Okay. And then specifically, if taking levothyroxine, um, mm. should I not take psyllium? Uh, levothyroxine is taken in the morning. So, you know, uh, levo, uh, psyllium can be taken uh, at lunchtime and dinner time in that case. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, here's a specific one, but it's a good one. A1C test. Define good. <laughs> yes, here we go. 6.4, 6.6, 6.6. 6. I get plenty of exercise, eat DASH diet, consume 30 to 50 grams of fiber daily. Anything else I can do to prevent becoming diabetic? Uh, which fibers? Yeah. He... So the question is which fibers? They have to be viscous fibers, number one. And they have to remain uh, uh, viscous in the stomach. In our stomach, it's a big uh, acidic stop. It's like, uh, and and some fibers, uh, we're not really sure what happens to them when they reach the stomach. I'm thinking of pectin. Um, it's possible that uh, in animal models, it, it, it does survive the acidity of the stomach, but in humans, it's less sure. Uh, I've seen one study that was saying the opposite. So, it really, which fiber do you take? Uh, you remember we divided the fibers between uh, soluble and soluble, and the soluble you go with uh, whether they're viscous, not viscous, fermentable, not fermentable. 
So really, the question is which which fibers does he take? Yeah. Uh, all the viscous yeah. fibers have shown some effect on A1C. At least the one I know, there's four or five of them. Uh, there's even a study that compares uh, uh, the different uh, uh, viscous fibers, um, and I forgot if it was diabetes or cholesterol, but they, they were looking they were looking at all of them. Um, I forgot who, who wrote this one. Yeah. So it depends. Yeah, one fiber doesn't equal the other fiber. Um, there's another question about in um, type two diabetes how you can take it as if you can take it as needed. Um, uh, so, and I, I believe they're speaking to psyllium. Can you take it yeah, as no, needed? No, for uh, I mean you could, you could, but once you know the the mechanism how it does. You know, most likely, and and you remember it was saying like the study from um, uh, uh, Mofad. I was saying like the the longer duration of of psyllium use, the better you see a result. Uh, so when it comes to diabetes, I would do it before at least uh, 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 the main meal, uh, and uh, if not two meals. Um, so the otherwise... largest from your prior two hours prior to your largest meal or prior no. right. No, right no the two hours, that's for the medication. No, when it's yeah. before me, it's 10 to 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah. No, if he really wants the person, uh, they really want to interfere with the absorption of, of, of glucose and, and, and having the ileal kick, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, it's better to take it. There's, there's a duration effect and also a dose effect. And you remember, it's uh, long enough and it's around 7 to 10 grams a day. Divided. Divided. Got it. And um, so that comes to this one one last question about how much psyllium do you recommend daily? And and I think you covered that, but so yeah, I can answer. You know, it really depends what you want to do with it. You know, some people use it to to improve the the uh, GI transit time, either direction, and those can do some uh, uh, dosage finding. You know, they, if they're happy with three grams a day, once a day, that's good for it. If it's an IBS patient. The same, they can take it whenever they want and, and, and see how it works. Um, so in, in those cases, it's uh, like, uh, it depends on what they want to achieve. If it's for cholesterol, diabetes, I would say before meals. Oh, and another effect, society, uh, this one seems to, to, to turn down the craving we can have between meals. So it's, it's a good, it's good to help with, um, with, um, the, the just the food intake the and and help a person with weight loss as well yeah, yeah snacking snacking absolutely snacking. yeah that's uh that's that's really interesting yeah that was a study from a uh, gib i think uh, give the same guy from uh, Porta and Gabor. yeah that is really interesting um uh, oh here's <laughs> we got one more um can we take it with apple cider vinegar water yeah, so that's a great question because it's opened the, the door to something much more interesting. <laughs> uh, so whatever you mix it with, uh, I mean, apple cider, you said water, what was the other one? It'd be apple cider, uh, vinegar, or water. I, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, all of the above, yeah. As long as uh, there's water in them. But what happens to, let's say, the idea is to give uh, apple cider through uh, cilia, it will be trapped within the gel. And what happens when it goes through, uh, I would assume most likely it stays within the gel. Uh, nobody has studied that. So if the idea is to deliver apple cider to the colon, I don't think it works. It would, they would have to use a different viscous uh, fiber. That's a really, that's actually a really great question. Um, mm -hmm. So this, this has been a wonderful talk, Dr. Skiri. This has been a wonderful Sorry. talk. I went over time. So you're <laughs> well, we still have people, so I think it's an, that people are interested. It's okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. You've done great. Um, and and we want to thank everyone for spending their evening with us. Um, um, we will be sending out a copy of this talk to all the registrants if they want to visit the health library um, uh, website there's a video library where you can see view it on demand it'll probably be up in a week or so um so we we really appreciate this please join us we have two other talks in this series um 
November 14th, Gina Milano, one of our wonderful dietitians, will be speaking about healthy holiday side dishes, and we'll be sending out the recipes of those. And, and then we have Desi Zahaveria, who's a, um, uh, uh, has her doctorate in exercise physiology and works with patients with diabetes. Um, and she's going to be speaking about movement in your, in, increasing the movement in your daily routine. So we just want to thank everyone. And of course, Dr. Skiri, you have made fiber so interesting. <laughs> fiber and psyllium. Psyllium, you put yeah, that, it that, on the map. <laughs> that, that's chapter one, but... Yeah, one fiber is is one thing there. Yeah. So I, I hope people will get more interested in fibers and 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 when they don't know which one to take, whole food is always the way to go. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night.